fine leadership and critical care. He's been a chief nurse, nursing officer for the past 20 years with the Affinity Ministry Ascension Health Systems, and he's been at HFM for the past two years. Tom, the webinar is yours. Thanks, Randy. And hello to everyone. Um, I appreciate the invite today to talk about uh, the impacts of COVID in our community. We certainly have had uh, a significant amount of uh, putting up my question and answer so I can see them. Uh, we've certainly had a, a lot of impact the last uh, several months, eight months uh, since the COVID started. And I uh, hope to provide a little insight to some of the other unintentional elements that the COVID has had on the healthcare. And I'm trying to advance my slides. They're not advancing. There we go. So a little background, early impact of COVID that we've had since March when we first started being impacted here in the county of Manitowoc. The outbreak is a respiratory disease caused by a new coronavirus virus that was first detected in China. Uh, it quickly was detected in 70 locations internationally, including the United States. It's called the SARS-CoV-2 as the disease is caused it's been renamed the Corona Disease 2019. On March 11th, the World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 a pandemic. The, the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic is really the scope across the world. An epidemic is a, a large uh, infection of a region and uh, a pandemic is several regions. Most COVID-19 illnesses are very much like uh, bad colds or the flu. Uh, it starts with uh, a mild or a serious illness in 16% of the cases, and our older people and people with uh, compromised immune systems seem to be at the greater risk. As it progresses, we're learning that um, uh, disproportionately uh, people who are obese are with BMIs greater than 30, 35, or 40 are disproportionately impacted, as are uh, African Americans and Hispanic populations as we as we are impacted here in the United States. Early in the uh, course of the COVID-19, we had no real treatment. There was a lot of experimenting and uh, applying what has worked in influenza and other viral infections. And uh, we had a high utilization of ventilators. In fact, I think most people are aware of the uh, the mass production of ventilators and redistributing of ventilators to the highly impacted areas such as New York. We had community shutdowns to slow the spread and reduce the curve. We, we essentially had no testing in the beginning, then limited testing that was state or regional, and now we're expanding on many of our tests. And at the time it hit Wisconsin on the first wave, it was at the same time as influenza. And uh, I remember in March, three quarters of our people were really influenza and a small fraction of our impacted population had COVID. This, uh, this slide shows a distribution, uh, both Wisconsin, and, but it's customized for Manitowoc County. So Manitowoc year to date as of the 19th has had 2,151 cases. And uh, we currently have about 1,300 active cases and 850 recovered. Uh, to date, we've had seven deaths. I know in our hospital, we've only had one. So some of the people are dying in outside of a hospital setting. If you look at the rate of, we have 80,000 people in our county with the 2,150 people impacted. That is a less than 2% or about 2% of our population so far has been impacted, a fairly small number. And our death rate is a 0.003 are a, a less than half of 1%. Our rates are very 
aligned with the state of Wisconsin as a whole, with the same percentages in both. However, the, recently there's been an uptick in the number of cases throughout the Northeast Wisconsin region, uh, several hundred cases a day uh, in our area. So that is a significant increase in what we're calling wave two. As of October 19th, the state has had 174,000 cases uh, with 1,600 deaths. Again, that's less than a half of a percent of our population of nearly 6 million people. And again, the highest numbers in September and October for Northeast Wisconsin. Uh, the current trends, the COVID-19 is no longer an illness of our older population. In fact, you see uh, two slides previously, it's pretty well distributed uh, in a bell curve with the majority of the people impacted being between 30 and 60. Uh, we have learned that there are far more asymptomatic people that was originally thought. One of the either advantages or disadvantages of the mass testing we're doing is we're finding a lot of positive patients who really aren't sick at all. And then that leads to some of our increased spread. And therefore we encourage everyone to behave as the, each person as though they've encountered COVID-19 and taking precautions. The latest update on treatments is in the prevention area, it's vitamin D and zinc, which helps the immune system. Then the NIH, the National Institute of Health, recommends resemdivir for hospitalized patients. We have several doses on staff here and um, that we have um, administered uh, at least 15 or 20 doses to date. Also, uh, that treatment goes for five days. Convalescent plasma is the other drug of choice that uh, is given if a person is uh, compromised. And then of course, uh, supplemental treatment for antibiotics and cortisone, specifically dexamethasone. What's, uh, what's the latest on the vaccination? We, we have a, five companies that are working very hard on vaccinations. They are ready on mass production, but uh, the, the testing takes time. They are in phase two trials. We think the best uh, knowledge we have is we anticipate them early to late winter when they would be coming out. And we, but we don't know for certain. So we encourage people to take precautions as mentioned earlier, the one treatment we do have is uh, the flu vaccine and it is available now and hopefully everybody listening today has received their flu vaccination. So now as we transition into what are some of the impacts on behavioral health and community anxiety, um, we, we have learned from past pandemics that there is a significant impact on the mental health. And during SARS, we saw a 30% increase in suicide and rise in self-harm and alcoholism. During the 1918 pandemic, there was an increase in the suicide rate after the pandemic had uh, recovered. You know, in, in our house, uh, myself being in healthcare, we have, uh, I'm asked questions all of the time uh, about COVID and COVID-19 and treatment. So one of the fun things that I've implemented to keep my own mental health uh, saying is I've implemented no Saturday COVID-19 questions. So uh, my family knows don't talk to me about COVID on Saturday. I'll ask, answer the questions after work or on Sunday. But there are many people who are getting uh, tired of a lot of the questions and the uh, issues. So one element that we're seeing is a lot of anxiety and depression, and I would state rising anger uh, in the community and then both ends of the spectrum. We see people who feel it's a political conspiracy and that everything's going to go away in November. On the other side, we have people very concerned that people aren't taking it seriously and not wearing their mask. And all of that has increased a lot of the anxiety uh, and, and I think family dynamics and functions. Researchers have observed that anxiety is associated with stress and reduced sleep quality. And certainly what we have going on right now is, is contributing to that. Alcohol consumption went up 35% uh, percent and then to 55% in the week ending of March um, of 2020 this year. Online alcohol, online alcohol sales have increased 243%. And I'm sure here in the state of Wisconsin, we, we are contributing to that. 
And then the, the DHS data is showing a 17% increase in opioid overdoses compared to the same time last year. So we are seeing some significant impact. I like this slide and that it shows you uh, a lot of the variables that will lead an increase to suicide and what COVID is, is contributing to that. So the COVID creates uncertainty and social isolation and severe economic problems for several of our community members. These disproportionately impact our vulnerable population, including those with pre-existing and psychiatric disorders, low resilient people, individuals who reside in the high prevalence area, and a family member or friend who has died. And then if you have an existing condition such as anxiety, depression, or a psychiatric, and then tie on the added alcohol, the, all of these contribute to a current and probably in the future increase in suicide. So what can we do with our seniors? Our seniors have been uh, disproportionately impacted uh, and there are several things that we can do. Uh, and I, I use my own mother-in-law as an example who had to have uh, an emergency surgery on a hip fracture and the impact of, of her having to go into a skilled care facility during a COVID pandemic uh, can lead to increased stress and certainly for us to be the advocates of the seniors. Um, also, I had a mother who was in a different state at the beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic and she's hard of hearing and dependent on my sisters for her care. And um, she needed blood and, the, and because of a mix up of communication, end up in the emergency room having a repeat of several tests. And I'll talk about some of the strategies to address those types of issues. But uh, for myself, I've had two family members that impacted by this. And I'm sure as I visit with other, and I'm sure many of you listening, it's, this is impacting almost every household in America on the ability to support our seniors in the, in the homes. So without the support, the, the seniors have a much greater depression rate, uh, a loss of appetite and cognitive and physical decline. Uh, I have a friend whose mother is 100 and everybody remarks how well she is and how mentally alert she is. But with the COVID, she has declined uh, very rapidly because of the inability to visit and not really understanding and getting that support and stimulation from family members every day. Also, at access to nutrition with some of our vulnerable populations is a contributing factor and then worsening of physical conditions, uh, unnoticed decline in disease process. We just recently had an individual in our hospital who had a decline uh, in health uh, stopped eating for several days and because the family members aren't able to be there, uh, had an unnoticed bowel obstruction and as a result um, passed away. So these are some very real and, and sad stories that are uh, the impact of the social isolation on our seniors. So uh, Reinforcing as countries are affected and I think uh, impacted by the New York uh, uh, learnings on the early COVID here in the United States, the seniors have been told to self-isolate and it's becoming a very long time. We're eight months into this. And social isolation among older adults is a serious public health concern because of the heightened risk of cardiovascular, autoimmune, neurocognitive, et cetera. And certain research has demonstrated that the social disconnection puts older adults at greater risk for anxiety and depression. And several of the examples that I just shared kind of, you know, really highlight that. So again, as uh, members in the community that most of us have elderly family members, what can we do to support our, our elderly family members? So socially, we need to keep them engaged, uh, get them on social media. I know, um, uh, teaching my 93-year-old mother how to use an iPad and getting FaceTime uh, was challenging and fun at the same point in time, and we're able to coordinate visits on a regular basis. Medically, I, I want to urge that I think this is very important. Uh, there has to be a way that you support them on a participation in medical visits, whether it's through your FaceTime as their, your parent is going uh, into a health visit or if you're allowed to visit with them. 
uh, setting up care conferences, as I mentioned at the beginning or earlier in the presentation, my mother-in-law had an emergency surgery. Uh, it was very important for my wife and I to participate in care conferences to ensure we understood and how to support her through all of her treatment plans. Depending on your situation, do you have an assigned power of attorney or a spokesperson? Uh, do you have them engaged? Do you have them participating in the videos um, and are the face-to-face -face medical uh, exams? Are you working with your family member to ensure vaccination for influenza and pneumonia? So in a large study recently, uh, delayed healthcare and COVID-19, this came out of England, the findings support that the hospital admissions and overall emergency visits dropped dramatically and, and for heart attack, stroke and, and hyperglycemic crisis, they've all declined as the start of the pandemic. And at the same time, there's an excess death directly or indirectly related to COVID-19. Uh, and, and what are the impacts and what is the correlation between the decline on one type of visit and the increase of areas in the other? Uh, very concerning that care avoidance will lead to missed opportunities for management of chronic conditions and routine vaccinations or early detection of new conditions. I mentioned the, the um, bowel obstruction that uh, led to a death. There are several examples that many of us in healthcare can can be sharing with people uh, as a result of the, the delay in healthcare. Our bigger concern coming is what will be the impact of the delay in cancer screenings. Right now, several of the healthcare organizations throughout Wisconsin are being incentivized by the payers to try to close the gap on breast mammography and colon cancer that have been delayed as a result of delays in healthcare and the, and the closure. And hopefully we won't find a large number of carcinomas that have advanced during that stage, but there is sure to be some. And as we try to catch up, there's this increased demand and we have limited capacity to try to catch everybody up. So it's a, it's a real problem as we try to close that gap right now. And now COVID fatigue, we've been in a very long haul uh, eight months and counting that we'll, we're worrying about COVID. I don't suspect it's going to end in the next month uh, or two. We have high hopes in the vaccination, but that's not proven yet. Um, and as people have become fatigued, we've had an increase in our social gatherings, such as weddings and other parties. This is where our number one spread of COVID-19 is coming from, is family functions. Uh, a lot of people were concerned it was going to be coming from school, We'll see when they come back from Thanksgiving break, but predominantly the bulk of our spread has been weddings and family gatherings as we do the, uh, the tracers of those who turn positive. We're all very social uh, people and, and this increase in gatherings and combined locations um, is not conduct conducive to wearing masks. People uh, don't feel like it's normal to wear a mask and many people are getting tired of this and foregoing and again, if you go on Facebook or social media or within your own family and friends, you're going to find some that are, uh, you know, very ritual in wearing their mask and very protective to the other end where they're downright angry about having to wear a mask and uh, really stating outwardly that they have no intention of, of wearing it, which is a big concern from us in the healthcare side. So what are the precautions that we can do right now? on preventing the spread. First and foremost, behave as though everybody around you has COVID-19 because many of the patients uh, are people that are uh, infected are asymptomatic, meaning they had no idea they were sick or they thought that their allergies were acting up or that they had a very minor cold. The, the good news is the majority of people impacted by COVID have very mild symptoms. The bad news is the wrong person gets it and it is very deadly virus. So wear your mask. I highlight that in red. I can't stress enough. The wearing of the mask very clearly shows that if both sides are wearing a mask and, and you maintain your distance. We are dramatically reducing the spread for those who are compliant with those two elements. Practice frequent hand, hand hygiene and keep your environment clean. 
as hard as it is, as the holidays come, we may need to focus on virtual greetings rather than attending gatherings of large size. Uh, you need to get your flu shot and stay healthy. Those are the best ways to either not get the COVID-19 or reduce the impact. Now, regarding the increase of COVID-19, is it really safe to come for care? Several of us in healthcare from multiple organizations, uh, I think universally we all state that we feel healthcare, safe, healthcare facilities are the safest place to be. Uh, I have more concern about going to the grocery store or to a family member's house than I do coming to the hospital because everyone here is wearing a mask and uh, we enforce that pretty rigorously. Uh, we take the temperature of everybody coming in. I know that my temperature is 97.8 just about every single morning. We have rigorous uh, cleaning at all times as a normal part of our care. We're doing increased uh, cleaning in certain areas. We're reducing visitors. Although we do allow visitors for patients who are admitted just for those same reasons that I highlighted for the seniors, we believe that a patient advocate uh, is supportive and helps reduce unintended issues. And are we ready for you? Yes, we're, we're busy. We often have influxes in our census and healthcare settings. We, we hit 100, 105% capacity uh, in several years in a row and nobody really knows it when we have a flu outbreak or a neural virus outbreak. So we have protocols and processes in place where we can increase our demand in one location and, and decrease supply in another and adjust for the fluctuating censuses. But we are certainly ready for any health emergency and to maintain routine and regular care of the patients who trust us. So I know we're tired, um, but remember, as we started this pandemic, we started with a few spreading to a few, but now we currently have thousands spreading to thousands. In the short term, uh, I like the statement that uh, I've heard some of my colleagues say, it's better to miss one birthday than all of the rest of them. Uh, I've attached for the, in the presentation for all of you uh, a couple of websites from the Department of Health Services here in Wisconsin, as well as at Holy Family Memorial links that have different topics for helping uh, on a COVID series, series and ways to support those of you at home. So that concludes the presentation portion and I can open it up to questions or uh, comments. Is our moderator out there? One of the questions that I've received is where can we get our influenza vaccination? And I believe uh, almost every uh, clinic at this point in time has um, the flu shots available as well as the uh, drug stores uh, are all offering this at this time. Well, if there are no uh, questions, I wish you all a very good day. Thank you for your time today.
Uh, what are some of the alternative measures that one can use to reduce anxiety? Um, one is don't listen to the news every day. Uh, if you're if you're practicing your uh, what you need to do to protect yourself at work or school or at home, uh, know that there's bugs out there all of the time. Wear your mask and then find ways to have diversion activities, things that you can do after work or after school that will help. One of the questions for those organizations restricting access to public members or large gatherings, what metrics would you recommend using for those organizations to determine when to loosen their restrictions? Um, I think as we get over this next curve and we get the the local uh, spread to a back to a normal range down to less than 50 new cases a day, we can start to loosen some of those restrictions at this time. But with the, with the number of new cases being uh, 100 to 200 a day, it is definitely a time to avoid some of the public gatherings. Hopefully that answered your question. The follow-up question, is there a reason behind the 50 cases per day? It, it shows a decline in the spread and that it's tapering off. Uh, it, other, than, other than looking at what your trend is, it just shows a declining trend and that uh, per ratio of the population, it, it will be declining. Well, again, I thank you all. And if there are no further questions, I will um, give you back some time for your lunch hour. Have a great day.